Uh, let's, uh, a couple things I want you to do is turn your Bible, if you will, into Genesis chapter 7. Uh, we're going to talk today, for, and those of you that are watching on the internet, we're going to talk today uh, about the different comets that have been in the sky that have affected the world since the beginning, actually. It's just, the comet Ison that's on its way is not just a well, it's, a, it's not just a passing thing. It's no big deal. When it's gone, we'll forget about it. Everything that God created was good. And everything he created had a biblical plan in his time frame. So if you go to Genesis chapter 7, this is about the flood. I want to share this with you, though. Since last night's service, there has been uh, a 6.0 earthquake in Venezuela. A 6.4 earthquake shaking things up in Greece, 6.4 in Trinidad, and a strong 6.3 in New Zealand. That's since we had church last night. And there's a cyclone, Cyclone uh, Phelan, that has come ashore just as we were getting ready for, as I was actually preparing this afternoon, uh, in India. And this cyclone is one and a half times larger than Katrina. And it's coming ashore just as we're speaking right now. And it's headed right toward the Bay of Bengal. It's coming in, and it's in the path of 12 million people. They have evacuated less than half a million of them. The rest are riding it out. And, I can and it's also people that have evacuated are going up into the mountains of Orissa, Heidi, where Sammy and where our orphanages are that we support. You folks, you folks help me with the... Pakistan, I think, yeah. And we have, we have one orphanage in Pakistan we support. We have two orphanages in Orissa, India. And I went to India and visited them. So I can tell you, I, I mean, I spent a week there. I preached there. People were saved. We had miracles. And the little children are just precious. And they're orphans that uh, are brought into this orphanage and are taught about Jesus and taught English and are given food and clothing, and when they are done, when it's time for them to go into the world, they're educated, and they're ready, and this has been going on for 35 years, and then those, those children are able to get some of the better jobs in the government, and they're able to help, and they're, uh, most of them are, have become preachers and evangelists, and they go into the jungles and villages, so th it's amazing ministry. It's not just helping them survive. It's equipping them for the end times. And so I, and I love it because I know every dollar we send goes directly to them. That's what's so awesome. Not that there isn't other good charities. I know there is. But we personally know this. And so we praise the Lord. Not only for India, but Pakistan as well. As they're raising up an army as well of, of believers. And anyway, this, cy this cyclone is heading that direction. But the good news is our, our kids are up in the mountains. They're actually up where people are trying to get. So they're going to be okay. No matter how bad this storm is, they're going to be okay. Okay, so give the Lord some praise for that. We praise God. Uh, so these are the things taking place. Uh, since the beginning of time, God has made the earth a living, breathing entity. It's alive. The earth's alive. Not just us on it, but the earth itself is alive. And in the days of the flood... The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 7, says the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens, male and female, and of beasts that are, are not clean by two, male and female. Of course, the fowls of the air. All the animals were to get ready to go into the ark. Verse 4, For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth, Forty days and forty nights, and every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. This is unbelievable. I mean, to hear that prophecy has got to be stunning. And Noah did according to all that the Lord had commanded him. And Noah was 600 years old when the flood came. He actually started building the ark at age 500. It took him 100 years. Can you imagine that? 500. Hey, I got a vision for you. You got to build an ark. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Uh, um, Dr. Summerall said when he was teaching us uh, years ago, he said that the latter part of your life, you should be doing more in the end than you are in the beginning for the kingdom of God. And so he was 86 years old, and 
I mean, he was preaching all over the world, and, and, and he had television networks and everything going on. And, you know, he was 86 overseeing that. And his thing was he never stopped. The man never stopped until the Lord just took him home. And so, but praise God for that, that he was faithful to the end. Well, Noah, it says that Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters was up on the earth. And here it is, verse 7 says, And Noah went in and his sons, his wife, his sons' wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood, of clean beasts and of beasts that are not clean, and of fowls and of everything that creepeth upon the earth. There went in two and two, and Noah in the ark, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. And it came to pass that after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth, and in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. So not only did it rain on the earth, but the fountains of the earth opened up. Water come up out of the earth. It opened them up. Which means there had to be some mighty force to have done that. And so uh, different scientists have been studying what in the world could have been so powerful in such a mag magnificent event to literally cause the fountains of the earth to open. And in the Indian Ocean, they discovered a meteorite that is, uh, I mean, unbelievable. It's three miles wide in size. It lays on the bottom of the Indian Ocean. They've, divers have went down there and tested it. It is from space. It did not, it's, not, it, it's not part of the Earth's elements. It came from space. So at some time or another, this thing hit the Indian Ocean. According to scientists, with a, a meteorite that large striking the Indian Ocean, it would have created a tsunami a mile high. It would have caused, the, they would have caused a series of tsunamis that would have caused, the, the, literally, the fountains of the earth to break open. So in other words, what they believe is a tremendous comet came and struck the earth during the days of Noah and the flood. Not only did it rain, but the earth opened up. Okay, now... The, if you turn your Bibles also, go with me to Genesis chapter 19 for a moment because there's another major event that may have or scientists believe and is very possible was created as well. God, again, using comets. In Genesis chapter 19, the Bible tells us about the stories of Sodom and Gormiah and how that the Lord said he would destroy the cities because of the wickedness there. He told Abraham this. Abraham didn't like that prophecy. Not every prophecy goes over real well. I mean, you know, we all want to be blessed and highly favored. That's good. We are. And we all want good things to happen, and they do. But there's other times God sends warnings. God sends judgment or harbingers. As Jonathan Kahn, the Messianic rabbi who wrote the book, The Harbinger, and preaches that message, it's, what he's basically preaching is, it's time that we repent. God is sending us a warning after warning after warning. Eventually, he will send the judgment. And as we were preaching a little bit last night, the 75,000 cows that have died in South Dakota, this is another warning of the word of God as it says in Hosea 4, 1 through 3. It tells us that, you know, these, because of there's no truth, there's no mercy, there's no knowledge of God in the land, and because of the swearing, the lying, the killing, the stealing, and committing adultery, the... Look, God, it's just going to break out. There's going to be so much sin that finally the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and the, and the cattle or the beasts of the field will die. And we're seeing it happen ever since, actually, the B.B. Arkansas event that brought in the year 2011. On New Year's Eve, to bring in the year 2011, 5,000 blackbirds fell out of the sky at the right just before midnight, about 12 minutes to midnight, they say, Blackbirds started falling out of the sky in B.B. Arkansas, and 5,000 of them did, bouncing off people's roofs, off their cars, in their lawns, in the streets, and it just stunned the city. And they tried to figure out what could it be. Scientists finally said, well, maybe uh, there has to be something wrong. They tested. They actually did autopsy on 63 of the birds. No disease, no starvation, no, nothing. No reason for the birds to fall out of the sky. Um, they all died of blunt force trauma, which means they dove headfirst 
into the concrete. I don't know about you, but I, I, you know, that, I, that, I'm not diving into the concrete unless commanded by God, which has to be a question you have to ask uh, because God said this would be one of the harbingers or one of the signs or the warnings of the Lord. And so they said, well, there was a few firecrackers that were being fired at night, and maybe they got scared and confused, and that's why they don't. So you know what happened? They canceled the next New Year's Eve. The city of B.B. Arkansas canceled all fireworks. Guess what happened? 4,000 blackbirds fell out of the sky in B.B. Arkansas on New Year's Eve. It was like God said, really? Let me show you I am God, and besides me there's none other. And there's no answer for it nor for the fish by the millions or for the cattle that are dying or for the 260,000 llama in Peru or the 350-some uh, dolphins in New Jersey or for any uh, 7,000 bald eagles that died in a landfill in Vancouver, Canada, gathering, eating dead carcasses of rats. And Jesus said, where the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. It's another one of the signs in Matthew 24. Obviously, everything that physically is happening also can have a spiritual um, uh, reflection. I, what I say is this, whatever's going on in the spiritual world sometimes manifests as in the physical. And you'll see that time and time and time again throughout the, the, the news, the events taking place, and according to the word of God. Well, here in Genesis, God told Abraham he was going to destroy Sodom because of the wickedness in the city. And we'll begin reading here about verse uh, 24, it says, Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gormiah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heavens. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities that which grew upon the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. And Abraham Gat up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord, or where he first had the encounter with the Lord. And he looked toward Sodom and Gormiah and toward all the land of the plain, and beheld that, lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass that when God destroyed the cities of the plain, that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot dwelt. A couple things here have happened. The Bible says it rained fire and brimstone out of heaven, which means something was falling from the sky. Well, if a comet or a meteorite or an asteroid, when they come, even if it's a small one, if they, if they break the Earth's atmosphere and are falling, they will become engulfed in fire. And it might, it might be a, a big rock that's caked in ice when it first arise but it will become fire and it a lot of times it will break apart and you've seen it I'm sure on YouTube videos or wherever you've seen this coming down it also brings with it a lot of sulfur okay a lot of sulfur the smell of sulfur is always where anywhere a meteorite asteroid or a comet was to hit it is believed scientifically because of where the cities of Sodom and Gormai are that it had to have been a major comet that God sent from the heavens right toward these two cities. And as it came, it was breaking apart, and it was literally raining fire and brimstone from the meteorite. So it had to have been a comet. And so God used again, he used a comet. So when did God make this comet? I mean, did because he did a deal with Abraham, did he not? I mean, he said, hey, if you can find, Abraham said, if, if, if I can find 50 righteous, will you spare the city? God said, I'll spare the city. So in other words, man's actions can control God's reactions. A lot of times we say, well, just the way things are. No, a lot of things are, are the, they are because of what we do. We don't understand that if you sow to the flesh of the flesh, you'll reap corruption. If you sow to the spirit of the spirit, you'll reap life everlasting. If you go around confessing blessings, blessings are coming your way. If you go around cursing people or upset or always negative, get ready for negative reactions. Because the Bible says that the, in the death and life are in the power of the tongue. And so, uh, you know, even that's why G the Bible says bless your enemies. Because you're still sowing good seed when you do that. And uh, uh, it's important. 
And it's also uh, learning the discipline of a Christian to allow the Holy Spirit to guide you instead of your own flesh. I'm not saying you won't get mad. The Bible says anger but sin not. Your flesh will get mad. Somebody comes in here right now and insults you. I guarantee you, you're not going to like it. But how are you? It's, and here's, I preached a message a long time ago entitled, It's not what you're going through that I'm worried about. It's how you handle it. And uh, it's so, because all of us are going to, you know, Job said, man that's born of woman a few days and full of troubles. He comes forth like a flower. He's cut down. He flees as a shadow and continueth not. We're all in this thing, in the, in the walk of life, but we will face adversity. We will face unbelievable challenges. And how do you deal with your circumstance? Your testimony, both of you ladies, your testimony of your daughter is a tremendous testimony of how to deal with an unbelievable crisis. Most people, and I'll be honest with you, most people would literally have fallen apart, have completely went into the gutter, and, have, and probably wouldn't even be here. They would, it would be over. Satan would have worked them over. Uh, it's unreal. But if you're anchored in Jesus, if you have Christ in your life, you know that he said, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you, but go with you all the way, even to the end of the world. And the end of the world came for the cities of Sodom and Gormiah. The, uh, the sin that had brought upon them this tremendous destruction. Let's read what it says. It says in verse 24, And the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gormiah the brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. He overthrew those cities. So it came down. And they, over the cities of all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that were grew up on the ground. But his wife Lot... His wife looked back from behind him. She became a pillar of salt. Now, I went, when, back in, 19, I didn't go there. When I went to Israel in May, I didn't go to the Dead Sea that, on this past trip. Uh, I just stayed around Jerusalem and Jericho and Bethlehem and that kind of area. But in 1996, uh, I went to the Dead Sea. I went to Masada and I went to the Dead Sea. And uh, it's, it's an unbelievable experience because in the middle of the desert, out of nowhere, there's this absolute perfect, gorgeous sea that's blue. It just per it's beautiful, you know, and the mud's got healing properties there. People are rubbing mud on them and things and buying things of mud and all kinds of stuff. The water's so buoyant that you literally can almost be like Jesus and Peter. You can almost walk on the water. And the reason for that is salt water is 3% or ocean water is 3% salt. But this, the Dead Sea is 33% salt. Now, you think about the numbers just for a minute. You, also, the earth is made of 75% water and 25% land. You, the human body is made of 75% water and 25% clay. And every mineral on this planet is found in every one of you. So when God said he made you from the dust of the ground, he literally did. And he made you in the image and likeness of God. And God has a perfect cycle about the human body. He made it exactly to reflect the earth itself. So that's why the earth is the Lord's and the glory thereof. But here's the key. The, the salt water is 3% salt or the uh, ocean water. And you have, are made of water. And you also have a 3% salt content. Okay? But. Only and only the Dead Sea is 33% because of whatever fell from the sky and, and burnt these cities and so, so hot and so fast that it literally created a sea. It's 33% salt and the sulfur content is unbelievably high. Nothing can live in this sea. It's, that's why it's called the Dead Sea. Nothing, not a fish, not a plant, not algae, nothing. If a bird tries to fly over the sea, it will die. It will not get across the other side because the vapor is coming up of too much salt content. Jesus died on the cross. No, hey, wait a minute. The fire was to do what? To destroy a cursed city, to cleanse the earth of cursed cities, leaving 33% salt content that it has been purified. Jesus died on the cross at the age of 33. And he was the unleavened bread. That was, he was also the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He went and died. To, he took upon him the sins of the world, the Bible says. The sins of the world. 
and he took it to the cross. The scripture says anything that hangs on a cross is to be called cursed. He was so cursed by taking the sins of every one of us that his father turned his back and didn't even look at him. And Jesus said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But it was the moment of intensity. It was the moment of uh, purging. It was the moment of cleansing. And he died for the sins of the world. So it's not an accident that there is such, uh, th that these things are so perfect in the eyes of God. But Lot's wife. She looked back. Now, if you turn your Bible, if you will, with me just for a second, go over to uh, Luke chapter 17 uh, and verse 19. Let's go over there for just a second as this relates to the comment. We'll get the comment, Ice, and we're working our way toward it right now. Okay? Uh, in in uh, Luke 17, the story, Jesus mentions Lot's wife, he, and he does a little bit more now, but here's what he says in the Gospels. In Luke 17, verse 19, the Bible says, And he said unto them, Arise, and go thy way, thy faith has made thee whole. And when he, was, when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. And he said unto the disciples, the days will come when ye shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and ye shall not see it. Now, obviously it was fulfilled after he went back to heaven and ascended. They, no doubt they wished he was there with them to talk to them, but at least they had the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says, and the days will come, okay, and then they shall say to you, see here or see there, go not after them nor follow them. For as lightning that lighteneth out of the one part unto heaven, shineth unto the other part unto heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in the day. For, but first must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. Speaking of his crucifixion, I'm sure. Verse 26, and as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, also as it was in the days of Lot. Notice here, Jesus is comparing Noah's day to Lot's day. Now, I realize it's because of the wickedness. Man's hearts were on evil continually, it says in Revelation. Every imagination of his heart during Noah's day. And in Lot's day, it was so evil and so wicked, they couldn't find ten righteous souls in the Twin Cities. So Jesus is compared not only in a, in a sinful comparison between the two, but also is it possible that the comments that would come were also tied to the same times. And if that's the case, will comets be used in more biblical prophecies in the Bible? You guarantee it. We'll get there in a minute in the book of Revelation. So God uses signs in the heavens for a reason. To, the, to those that are spiritually aware, they understand it was the star of Bethlehem that proclaimed to the world that a Savior was born. They seen the star in the east. And they, even those that went to, to find Jesus said, we've come because we saw the star in the east. And, and uh, the comet Ison, which will be visible to the naked eye very soon. And I just, and I, have you seen reports saying it's going to fizzle? It's going to wimp out? It's going to, it's, well, I just this morning saw there was three brand new reports uh, by NASA and by other scientists that it is fine. The comet Ison is strong. It has not deteriorated at all. It's, on, it's going to be spectacular. If it survives the sun, it will be spectacular and so far it is not breaking apart it's on course it's bright and it's, it's going to be pretty good it's going to be amazing i really believe and so there's a significant reason for that but here noah and and the days of noah and in the days of lot so they did eat they drank they married wives they were given in marriage to the day that noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all likewise also it was in the days of lot they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. I, I read that this morning and, and, and then again this afternoon the Lord said, you know that, <laughs> you know I'm trying to reveal. You know I'm sending every sign there is. And I may have to use a comet again to get their attention one more time. 
I, I, you know, because that which it has been will be, and that which will be has been. There's nothing new under the sun, Solomon said, for everything that's been done has already been done. It's all vanity and vexation. So, okay, now listen here. It says, even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. For he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. If you're working in the field and you heard there was something coming and you didn't want your stuff in your house destroyed, you would go back and get it. If you, if, but Jesus says, don't even, don't even turn. Forget it. The day I'm revealed, don't even look back. So what did Lot do? When Lot and his wife and his, his daughters and their, and their husbands, they did, I mean, not their husbands, Lot and his daughters and his wife. And they were leaving. They were told to get out of Sodom. They're leaving. They've, they're out of the city. They're moving. When all of a sudden, fire and brimstone comes roaring from the sky, consuming uh, these cities so much it was like a furnace as the smoke rose. And actually what Jesus was saying is Lot, uh, Lot's wife didn't just look back and all of a sudden turn into this pillar of salt. She did more than just look back. She went back toward Sodom. And as Heidi was telling me, we were talking about that this morning, it's, it's one of the theories I believe is just because Lot and his wife and their two daughters left, they had a lot of family in there. They left family behind when they got out of there. And she may have been so to the point that she disobeyed the word of God because she had things, maybe earthly possessions, maybe people she knew as acquaintances, associations, and so she thought she could go back it's not looking back or just glancing back. It's people making a conscious effort to go back into bondage. And uh, that's why grace is sufficient. The Lord's grace is sufficient. We might make a mistake every now and then. We may sin. We may even take a look back every now and then. But don't, make a, don't come off the rooftop and try to go back. You're not going to make it, okay? And so Jesus says... Uh, in that day which he shall come on the housetop, his stuff is in the house. Let him not come down to take it away that he is in the field. Let him likewise not return back. Remember Lot's wife. Whosoever shall save, seek to save his life shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. Uh, I will, I tell you that that night there shall be two men, of course, in the bed. One's taking one. Again, you see the catching away. You see people that are going to be caught up forever to be the Lord. And you see the people that are left behind. And I don't want to be left behind. Okay? And I'm not going back either. Okay? Praise God. And so there's a significant situation here that Jesus is even referring to uh, the days of Noah and the days of Lot. And it's very possible that it was a comet that destroyed the cities of Sodom or Gormiah, as well as, here comes the, uh, the, the folks from Missouri coming in, as well as the, the, even the days of Noah. Now, it doesn't say that uh, a comet came from the sky in the days of Noah. It doesn't say that. But scientifically, water breaking up, the waters of, come on in, folks. How y'all doing? Good to have you again. The bets are here from Missouri. And the name of your town is like Odessa or something like that. Okay, I got you. Amen. And you know what? I was going to mail you my CD, but I decided that you was coming, so I just brought it with me. I got in the car to give it to you. Yeah. I, I did. I saved it. I saved it. I saved it. A little postage there. Yeah, that's right. You're coming. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, absolutely. It, absolutely. I mean, I, I don't know the day or the hour, but, I, but, but what I'm trying to share with you is every major event, I'm talking uh, and historically, and I had that. Um, Mike, actually, the pages you printed are good, but wasn't the very one, one page I needed. <laughs> but anyway, um, there has been comets that have fallen on specific days, biblically, uh, several of them, that, that in, historically there was a comet. I can also share with you the comet Negra, 
came by the earth in the year 1347. And that's the same time that the bubonic plague or the black death was at its all-time high. 25 million people died in Europe as the comet Negro was going by the earth. And oh, oh by the way, that was 666 years ago. And the comet Ison's down its way. Just saying. And, and, and so what I'm saying is God sometimes significantly sends every possible warning to try his best to get people to see that his son is coming. I mean, it's not a question of he, he's coming. But in the last days, scoffers will come, say, where is the promise of his coming? All I know all my life, my grandmother talked about it, and I've heard preachers on the ending. Harold Camping said it was May 21st, and then he said it was October 21st. There, they, there were people who set dates. In the year 999, there was a, a preacher that said this is the end of the world. In the year, um, in the year uh, 1843, there was a preacher out of Illinois who said this was the end of the year. There's been many of them have set dates. And unfortunately, and they might be good people, and they were so hungry for the Lord to come. I'm not going to throw them under the bus. But this is why you don't set dates, because you don't know. I mean, you're just taking a shot in the dark. You're just like throwing a dart at a dartboard. It's, I'm going to hit it. And, well, let's see. I doubt it. And the Lord said that when he does come, he's coming as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens are going to pass away, when our scripture says. He's coming when you least expect him. He's coming in an hour you think not the Son of Man cometh. He's coming. He's even at the door. He's, he's a lot closer than any of us sitting in this church. If we really knew when he was coming, we would, all of us, I'd drop this mic, all of us, and would hit this altar and hang on to it till the revival started. If we knew. But we don't know. But we walk by faith. We know he's coming. Okay? Amen. All right. Now, turn, if you will, into the book of Revelation. I want you to go with me to chapter 8. Revelation 8 for a moment. Uh, as I said, the star of Bethlehem is believed to have been a comet uh, because it acted like one. It was very bright and it came out and it just so happened to come out of the eastern sky and they seen it in the east. And it was prophesied that uh, they would see the star, and they would know that this would be a sign that the Son, the Savior, had come to the world. And so we know the story in Matthew 2. It tells you, they said, we have come to worship the child, for we have seen his star in the east. The comet Ison, folks, is, 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 just went by Mars. It's headed toward the sun. I saw fresh pictures of it this morning. It's good, doing well. It's going right toward the sun. It's going to come within 782,000 miles of the sun. That is close. That is so close that that's why some scientists believe it may just break apart and blow up and we won't see it. But if it comes around, as it, what it's supposed to do is come right there, scrape the sun, and whip around the sun. When it does, it will sweep its huge tail that's enormous. The tail is eight times wider than the earth. It is filled with rocks and debris and meteorites and comet dust and everything you can imagine. Yeah, so we don't know what it's, we don't know what that tail's going to bring. It might just be a spectacular show in the skies, or it might be fire and brimstone all coming on the earth. I don't know, and they don't. No one knows really, but it's coming. Okay, the comet is coming. The thing is, you will be able to watch it pretty soon, uh, around November seventh or so. You should start seeing it with the naked eye, and you'll be able to see it through the rest of November. Late November, it's going to be really bright. That at the day that's its closest point to the sun is the anniversary of when Israel was voted by the United Nations to become a state, which is uh, the 29th of November. Just so happened God timed that pretty well. It's a harbinger, yes. Oh, and by the way, the 28th, they say the 28th, 29th, it depends where you're at in the planet, because where you're standing, 28th, 29th. Well, so in other words, it'd be its brightest point, the 28th, 29th. The 29th is when Israel was become a state. Also... Uh, the 28th is Thanksgiving, but it's a different Thanksgiving like we haven't seen since the year 1888. This Thanksgiving is also the beginning of Hanukkah. It's so rare. It hasn't happened since 1888, and it won't happen again for 79,043 years. So in other words, it, it, this is it for this deal. 
This is a rare moment. So you're telling me that Hanukkah on Thanksgiving Day is going to hit the same time that a comet is going to be whipping by the sun coming from where? The east? And uh, maybe there's something biblical going on here. Maybe there is some signs in the heavens. Maybe. I'm just saying. Signs of what? Do we know when the Lord's coming back? No. But is this, again, God trying to say to the world, listen, look up. Your redemption is drawing nigh. And to the church, he's saying, you better get ready, get ready, because he's coming soon. Sooner than you can think. Praise the Lord. Well, let's go back to, I, was, I forgot one point about Lot's wife that I got to share. When a comet comes, it not only has asteroids and meteorites, but it has a ton of what they call comet dust. Tons of it. And the comet ice, and they say, is filled with dust. Unbelievable amounts of dust. So when it does whip around the sun, not only could we get hit maybe with a meteorite or maybe we'll see some meteorites crashing through the atmosphere, not doing any destruction, maybe, maybe not. But it's going to throw so much comet dust at us that it's going to illuminate the clouds at night. They will have a slight illumination for 40 nights. Just saying. 40 nights, just saying. Uh, now... Lot's wife, when she went back, on her way back, she turned into a pillar of salt. Uh, when they analyze, what does that mean? Well, if a, if a comet hits the earth, it brings this dust. The dust will literally ev almost evaporate anything that it comes on at that speed and that heat. It will turn you literally into dust, but the dust will be filled with salt or sulfur and so it's believed that if that was fire and brimstone hit when she turned into salt she literally turned into salt now there is there is another theory in that, and and i've seen it when i was there when you're down by the dead sea there is one rock looking statue it's 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 natural it looks like a person standing there and not far from the dead sea and there's no other rocks around it. It's just standing there. And I'm like, What's, why is that there? And then, of course, the, 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 uh, the uh, Jewish um, um, guides will tell you, well, we, everybody just calls that Lot's wife. Right? <laughs> yeah, we don't know either. That's just Lot's wife. And you're like, oh, really? Thank you, Jesus. Yes. So there is significant, you know, even scientifically, things continue to prove that God is real and his word is real. No matter how much science studies the earth, it finds that the very word that we preach from and the very word that we all live from is the truth and the living God. Now, let's go to Revelation chapter 8 for a moment. The scripture tells us of an event. This is now prophesied. I've been telling you about, um, you know, the days of Noah, the days of Lot. Uh, even as recently as 1347, the comet. Did that comet bring dust particles that possibly helped bring about the bubonic plague? I don't know. Maybe not. Just maybe it was a sign that something dreadful was coming upon the earth. And, the, and this comet was very visible. Um, we, don't, we do know the star of Bethlehem, no doubt, was a comet. And that was sending us a message of something wonderful coming to the earth. So the question is, does the comet Ison bring us a sign of something wonderful, something terrible, or both. Did you know there's a scripture in the Bible that says, for looking for the great and terrible day of the Lord? I think it's in Malachi. Great and terrible. How is something great and terrible? It's great for those that are saved, terrible for if you're lost. So you got to get this thing right. Now, okay, here you go in Revelation 8. It says, and when he had opened the seventh seal, there was a silence in heaven about the space of a half hour. My interpretation is my mother-in-law wasn't over. Are you guys Okay. No, I'm just joking. She's actually wonderful. It says there was silence in heaven for a half hour. So in other words, God was standing still just before he was getting to do something tremendous. You know, doesn't he say to us sometimes, just stay still? Just, just stand still. See the salvation of the Lord. Because a lot of times we get so busy and we get so uh, trying to figure everything out, you know, in our own lives. 
So in verse 2 it says, And I saw the seven angels which stood before God. To them were given seven trumpets. Another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came from the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. Something hit the earth. It, you know, it, something... So, so, all right, so John is on the island of Patmos in the Holy Ghost, and he sees an angel reach into the fire under, off the altar of God and throw this fire. Was it a comet? Was it a meteor? What, what was he? Was, he was throwing it off the altar, and it was so powerful and so great that there was thunders and lightnings and earthquake, and the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. So in other words, there was a major event hit the earth just before the trumpets sounded. So, so what I'm telling you is, it's that when God says, I will show you signs in the heavens and in the earth, there shall be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and distress of nations with perplexity, and the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear of things coming upon the earth. Because the, the Lord is coming soon, is what I'm trying to say. And he says here that the first angel sounded, there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of the trees were burnt up, and all the green grass burnt up. This is a major event. And the second angel sounded, there was a great mountain burning with fire. What? A mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. And a third part of the sea became blood. So was this a big comet? Was this a big asteroid? Was this a big meteorite? Whatever it was, it was off the altar of God. An angel grabbed it and slung it. And, it, and John saw it coming. He not only saw it in the, he not, he not only seen the, the spiritual event in heaven, but he also seen the physical manifestation. That's why when I say all the time, whatever's going on in the spiritual world, a lot of times you see it manifested in the physical. John, in the spirit, was shown both. He saw the angel grab the fire, throw it, and he's seen the results of when it hit the earth. Unbelievable. And then it says, and the third angel sounded, well, wait a minute, and the third part of the creatures, verse 9, which were in the sea and had, and had life, died. A third of the parts of the ships were destroyed. And the, angel, the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. So there's another one. So are, are they happening around the same time? Maybe. Do they happen in different periods of time? Maybe. Okay. I don't know. He doesn't tell us here, but he does say there is another one. He says, the third angel sounded. There fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. It fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died of the waters because they were made bitter, poisonous. And so, this is going to blow your mind. The, 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 the two scientists that discovered the comet Ison. They were Russian scientists. The first guy's name, and don't ask me to pronounce it, it's a, it's a Russian name with 19 letters in it. But it means living water. The second guy who was with him that had like 21 letters in his name, his name means bitter. That's the two guys that discovered, to, I'm just telling you that. that I'm just saying, just saying. So what are, what are you saying, Bagley? You're saying, uh, oh, and by the way, if you want to see Comet Ison around the 7th or 8th of November throughout the rest of the month into just about Christmas, all you got to do is get up early in the morning just before the break of day in the early hours and look toward the east because then you will see the Comet Ison. I'm just saying. 
And while you're doing that, keep in mind that that's the same direction you had to look if you were looking at the star of Bethlehem some 2,000 years ago. And this star is the brightest star since that star, I'm just saying, is God trying to get our attention. But, uh, and, and so it goes on to, so, and then you got, then you, oh, by the way, remember last year there was this comet called Lovejoy that was discovered, at, and it was going right to the sun. It was discovered by an Australian amateur with a telescope. He saw it. And he was able to get a hold of NASA. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. We got the Hubble telescope up there. We got the International Space Station. We got all these observatories. The United States government's funding all this stuff. And we got one Australian in the backyard with a telescope, finds a comet no one else can. And oh, by the way, his name is Lovejoy. <laughs> what? And this comet was supposed to hit the, or go cl close to the sun and disintegrate. It was over. They said, it's on a death trip. It's going to die. It's on its way to the sun. It's not going to make it. It's not coming out the other side. Folks, can I announce to you right now, the comet Lovejoy not only survived the power of the sun, but came out the other side brighter than when it went in and in the shape of a cross. Now, Jesus said, your faith is going to be tried like gold is tried in the fire thank you so in other words you might they might say you're done they might say you won't make it through this trial they might say you won't wake up you might have died six times Frida they might say Mike she's never gonna open her eyes she's never gonna see she'll never speak again she can't have another child you might as well give up you're not gonna make it hang on a minute Whose report do you believe? I re believe the report of the Lord. Because you just might come out the other side stronger than you are when you went in. And let me just say this to the body of Christ if you're watching right now. When the Lord comes back, we're going to come out the other side a whole lot stronger than we are right now. I'm going in weak, but I'm coming out strong. Paul said I was made strong in weakness. Praise the Lord. Woo, I feel like preaching right now a little bit. So what I'm saying is, God has got a plan here. He's working the signs in the heavens. And it's so, so the scripture, where, where am I at? I'm in, I'm in uh, Revelation. I'm so heavenly minded, I'm no earthly good. Help me. Oh, okay, okay. And so it says, 812, yes. And then the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died of the waters because they became bitter. A lot of folks are eating everything but the word of God. And then they wonder why they're in such a bitter shape. They listen to everything. They, and and, and if, you, if you try to out-talk the devil, he'll out-talk you. Every time. And you can't take criticism and negativity. The more you grow in the Lord, there will be people you know who will try to stop you from growing. Because they don't want to grow with you. And so they'll try to hinder you. Or they'll find fault with your church. Or they'll find fault with this. Or they'll find fault with that. And some of them don't like your hair. You use too much hairspray. This one here, I got highlights. This one, they, you know, I mean, they, people do all kinds of stuff to each other. It will, too. It's, that's right, brother. Amen. And if you are serving the Lord in the flesh, if you're trying to do that, you won't survive the heat of this furnace. You're not coming out the other side. But Lovejoy did get out the other side and was brighter than it was when it went in, which defied scientific logic, and it was in the shape of a cross. CNN was so excited about covering this thing, but after the cross showed, they went on to Geraldo looking again in that empty vault in Chicago. <laughs> Nothing there. Uh, it, it says in verse 12, The fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and a third part of the moon. And a third part of the stars, so that a third part of them were darkened. And the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. Now, whenever the uh, volcano at Mount St. Helens erupted back in 1980, there was such a blast. The smoke went up so high that it literally, they said, blocked the sunlight's ability to shine on Seattle and that area. It only had a third, only had about a third of the light, I should say. I don't know how to say it. It was, it was dingy, and it stayed that way for quite a while. This thing was so, it was like a furnace erupting. It was like, a, 
it was like uh, a thousand atom bombs. It was just something insane. And this world right now has several ticking time bombs. Yellowstone National Park has what's called a super volcano. That if that thing was to blow, would literally destroy about the whole west, northwestern part of America and southern, southwestern Canada. Uh, just from the initial shock waves. And then the fallout, the ash that would fall on a lot of America and Canada and other parts of the world would be suffocating. It would be unbelievable. So these are events that could happen. I pray they don't. I don't, I don't and if they do, I I'm, I'm believe I'm going to be on a different cloud. I think I'm traveling on a different cloud. I'm, I'm going to be out of here. Uh, praise the Lord. But the world should understand that if they get left behind, they are going to face the wrath of God. Can't escape. They can dig uh, bunkers under the uh, Rocky Mountains in Colorado. They can try their best to figure out a way how they're going to hide any major catastrophe. But my Bible says that they will literally cry for the rocks and the mountains to hide them from the face of him that sits on the throne. They will beg them to crush them. How can something be so unbelievably terrifying that you would beg a mountain to fall on you? I'll tell you what it is. It's the realization that you have blasphemed the God of glory. That if The realization that you actually rejected him and to actually know I messed up it's over this is not going to be a good thing and uh, there are unfortunately and you might be watching right now on the internet and you might be doing that very thing you might be just taking your chances see how you're gonna come out and take your chance you're not gonna come out the other side and it's not gonna be pretty when he returns with his raft I'm talking about with his raft and so uh, verse 13 it says and beheld I heard an angel flying through the midst of the heaven saying with a loud voice woe 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 to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound this thing won't be over it's just a warning right so comet Ison may be a sign to the believer that the Lord soon to come get us and it may also be a warning to the unbeliever that judgment is coming. God seems to work simultaneously. The Holy Spirit, you ever notice the Holy Spirit? You can be in a great church service, which I'm believing we're going to have tonight, and, and he, the Lord could be moving, and the saints are rejoicing, and the sinners are looking for a place to hide. It's the same Spirit moving, but it has different effects. It depends on the condition of your heart. The seed is good. Is your ground able to, to handle it? You notice when the sower went out to sow the seed, he sowed the seed. Good seed. The seed was the word of God. It was always good. But some of it fell on stony ground. Some of it fell on the wayside. Some of it fell in uh, good ground. It depends on the condition you are to receive the word. And if you don't give your life to Christ, then uh, you're in trouble. I can tell you that right now. But if you will accept the word and repent of your sins and give your life to Jesus Christ, you can be saved. Washed in the blood, filled with the Spirit of God. And I don't dread Comet Ison at all. I'm, in, oh, I'm actually going to be out there in the morning early saying, yeah, it's coming again. I wonder what's coming with it. Woo, glory. Man, I'm ready. If, if, if this is a sign of his return for the bride, here I am. Don't mind. I'm going to have, I might go out and make one of those, uh, you know, if you're on a deserted island, you're supposed to make an SOS, you know. I'm going to make one that says J-E-S-U-S. -S. Come over here. You know, praise the Lord. We, we, we're not, the, Paul said we're, we're looking for the coming of the Lord. We're looking for him to come without sin unto salvation. We're not dreading the coming of the Lord. We're anticipating it. Now at the same time, I have a tremendous burden for those who aren't ready. And even though it would be better for me to be with the Lord right now, maybe we need to be here right now for others who aren't saved. Maybe we have to deal with the issues of this life because we're, God needs us. We are their hope. We're their lifeline. They're watching us. They see all this joy. And notice something. When the tornadoes went through uh, Oklahoma last spring, was it? Um, Everybody thought, well, what's going to happen to those people down there? You know, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, same thing a couple years before that. And then when the media went down there to find a catastrophe, 
What they found was Christians cleaning up the streets, bringing water, helping people, praising the Lord. They would, I mean, they would, they would interview some granny. I saw that one granny. She's out there, and the, the, her house is destroyed. I mean, there's nothing left. It's firewood. Oh, and then, so uh, I, I forgot which. It was a CNN guy, and he walked up to her and says, so uh, this is, is this your house? Is this what, what it was? She goes, yep. That was, yeah, I lived there 40-some years. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, it must be devastating. Oh, she said, no, praise Jesus. I'm here. Hallelujah. I've got a mansion in the sky. What are you talking about? I just happened to be here when he destroyed it. That's all. I, this isn't my final. He, she started preaching to him. He's like, okay, well, that's good. We're going to show. Hold on. Hang on. So uh, just be, be so excited and be blessed what God is doing. But as I said, as I started uh, today, it, since last night's service, we've had a 6.3 earthquake in New Zealand, a 6.4 in Trinidad, a 6.4 in Greece, a 6.0 in Venezuela, and a cyclone one and a half times the size of Katrina just coming landfall in India. That's since we had church last night. And for people to say there is no signs of his coming, oh, let's do one more thing. Turn, if you will, to Luke uh, 21, just for a second. You guys can quote it anyway. Uh, but in Luke 21, notice what Jesus said. Wow, this, this is so good. I should preach this tonight. I really, I probably should. Look what it says here in Luke 21. In verse 25, of course, Jesus says, And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon. We're getting ready to go through a four-blood moon cycle starting on Passover next year through, the, through Tabernacles of 2015. Four blood moons. April 15th is not tax day for me. It's blood moon over Jerusalem day. It's the feast of the Passover, okay? So there's a blood moon on the feast of Passover, then a blood moon in the fall of next year on the feast of Tabernacles. Then in 2015, there's a blood moon on Passover, and then the blood moon on Tabernacles. How does that happen? How does that timed out just like that? Who's in charge of the calendar? Who's taking control of the situation? Maybe it's the man that made it all in the beginning. Uh, he said, there shall be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and upon the earth... The stress of nations, we know that's true. Look what's going on. And with perplexity or confusion. The sea and the waves are roaring. They're roaring today. Men's hearts failing them for fear, for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Something's coming. It's happened before. Obviously, it will probably, it will, it's going to happen again. And then shall they see the Son of Man, coming in a cloud with power and great glory. That's awesome. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up, lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Praise God. Let's all stand. We're going to praise the Lord here a little bit. And uh, free to sing another song for us and, and just praise the Lord. This is a little Bible study, but I think we've had a good time this afternoon. And um, the Lord is really revealing revealing tremendously in our in these days we live in god is so good and i'm so thankful for all of you who've driven so far to be here today and tonight and tomorrow whatever the lord and others that are coming uh we just praise god all these that are being baptized tomorrow we praise the lord for all of you we believe god is just richly blessing you and uh we just be thankful we can uh just be around to see it and be a part of it and watch the glory of god in your life Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And Mike, if you'll look in the chat room for a moment, because I know everyone here loves the Lord. I'm pretty sure of that. If there is anyone here, though, that would want to come and pray this, at this hour, it would be a wonderful thing to do. And I'd ask you to do that. You may want to. You may have a, you may have a, a burden or uh, something on your heart that you really want to pray about. And we will. We'll, prayer is good. We need to pray. Men ought to pray in that without ceasing, okay? More prayer. We can't pray enough, really.